module, we have been looking at uh, several characterization techniques which are useful for materials characterization. Uh, one of the most uh, prolific uh, characterization methods which has found uh, a useful application in a variety of areas, uh, mainly focusing on material uh, chemistry, um, is thermal analysis. Uh, it is also called as thermoanalytical method, uh, broadly because it has now become a family of uh, uh, <coughs> convenient techniques merged together. It's not a single uh, technique, but it has included many related uh, techniques to itself and it has spread into a big field. Uh, why I want to single out and give a separate lecture on thermal analysis is that um, there, are, there are more than three journals, international journals which are floated on just thermal analysis and those are nearly three decades old and uh, still several fascinating studies are coming up. So this is a very useful technique which has proved to uh, proved very useful <coughs> both to chemists, uh, physicists and uh, material scientists. Um, I call this as a very convenient technique because it is affordable and uh, most of the labs can have this uh, instrument and uh, the chemical processes that happen during uh, heating of a sample can be actually mapped both qualitatively and quantitatively. Therefore, you this is both a qualitative measurement as well as it is a uh, qualitative measurement. <coughs> so what this thermal analysis means, it's a measurement of changes in physical properties of a substance as a function of temperature. When the sample is undergoing a controlled temperature uh, program. So you can actually do this uh, variety of uh, events that are happening. You can try to trace using a isothermal heating also. Uh, suppose I don't have a thermal uh, analysis instrument. The best thing that I can do is um, freeze out uh, on a particular temperature and then try to map the changes that are happening. But we can also do a controlled temperature program which can take the sample from uh, room temperature to a known temperature and whatever that happens is nothing but the proper property which you can map it in the y-axis. So in the x-axis it's always temperature and in y-axis it can be anything that is coming out of such a process and the uh, output can these days be mapped very conveniently using a computer therefore you can analyze the data in a uh, in a very sophisticated way. So um, it's a it's a fairly simple uh, technique, but the amount of information that one can get it, it can transcend our imagination. A lot of uh, <coughs> references or uh, uh, particulars about this technique has been taken from this uh, website. Therefore, I request you to note this. Um, there are also groups working in. Uh, UK and uh, especially pirate.com which gives you useful information about it. Nish is uh, another company which has brought out commercial uh, thermogrammetric instruments therefore it is good to view all this. So what properties are measured we can see here. Uh, first regarding the property and uh, the corresponding technique and the abbreviation that is used for it useful to get used to it. Uh, if there is only a change in the mass, then you call this as thermogravimetric, usually called as TG or it is also called as TGA, thermogravimetric analysis. If it is to do with temperature, then you call this as differential thermal analysis and uh, this is nothing but DTA. Uh, you look at the uh, thermal changes in a differential pattern. And uh, when we say differential pattern, you always um, have a uh, standard sample and with respect to that, what are all the thermal uh, effects that are happening, you try to study in a uh, <coughs> differential way. Uh, the same uh, thing do to do with the thermogrammetry also, you can try to map this as a differential plot. So even if there are minute variations, you can pinpoint that very clearly uh, by differential TG. Suppose there is a uh, heat flow 
uh, or heat exchange that is happening, then you call this as uh, DSC, it's calorimetry. As you know, calorimetry means measurement of heat and uh, therefore you can also conveniently determine um, the uh, heat of uh, crystallization, heat of uh, fusion, heat of transition uh, or any enthalpic change that is associated with different chemical process. You can try to do that. It's a very popular method called DSC used by metal scientists. And uh, sometimes we miss out on very, very important mechanistic issues if you let go uh, some of the gases which are coming out of the process. So in such cases, it is also useful if you have a TG instrument and trap the gases that are coming out and those gases can be in a sealed tube so that it's only the gases which can be mounted into a uh, infrared uh, spectrophotometer and that will give you exactly the details of what the gases that are coming out. So your predictions are not just quali quantitative but you can also have a mapping of what uh, fractions that are coming out. <coughs> So it's called uh, uh, evolved gas detection or evolved gas uh, analysis. Uh, so you can analyze that using spectrophotometry. So as you see here, there are multiple events that are happening in just heating a sample and you can try to map several issues out of it. Uh, there are three which I want to pick up and uh, dwell a little bit more on the instrumentation and the principle. Uh, so uh, this uh, of all the thermal uh, analysis um, measurements that are listed, thermal analysis, uh, a group of techniques in which a physical property is measured as a function of temperature while the sample is subjected to a predefined heating or cooling program. So as I, uh, as I pointed out, uh, I'm going to single out um, these three <coughs> methods. Uh, differential thermal analysis is nothing but you are measuring the difference between the sample and the inner reference material. Usually, you are measuring the delta T. Okay? And it is measured as both are subjected to identical heat treatment. Both the reference as well as the sample are heated under same uh, thermal conditions or uh, same temperature. And the difference between these two is noted. Therefore, your reference material has to be inert to this uh, temperature uh, program. In other words, it should be stable with uh, no um, physical or chemical changes happening to that particular solid. Therefore, whatever that is happening, the difference between the reference and sample will solely be the manifestation of the sample. Differential scanning colorimetry, here we are not measuring the difference in temperature between sample and uh, the reference, but we are actually going to maintain same temperature for the sample and the reference irrespective of whatever changes that is happening to the sample. Therefore, uh, if the sample is uh, undergoing a particular change, whether it is a heat releasing or a heat absorbing reaction, then the temperature will all the time be maintained such a way the process will map how much of heat is absorbed or how much of heat is evolved during the reaction. So this is not the reaction, the temperature difference between sample and uh, the reference. It is the um, heat <coughs> flow, whether it is taken by the system or given out by the system, because you are maintaining both the reference and the sample temperature at the same time. Uh, and in thermogrammetric analysis, it is merely a change in the mass of a sample on heat. So these are the primary uh, differences, uh, but if you look at uh, the complementary nature, uh, the first two are complementary because they almost give the same information, but uh, DSC is more a quantifying picture, DTA is more a qualitative picture, uh, and uh, TG is a very different um, analysis altogether. So uh, basic principles of uh, thermal analysis mainly revolves around the instrumentation. So modern instrumentations used for thermal analysis consists of four parts. So if you think of a TG instrument, you, you should know that there is a sample and a specific sample holder. You don't just dump it into uh, any container. A specific sample holder is there 
uh, and the relevance of that I will emphasize uh, shortly now. And then you have very sensitive sensors, which mostly we call it as thermocouples, um, and then uh, an enclosure uh, in which the experimental parameters can be controlled. For example, we can do the heating of the sample using a heating element, RFRNET. Sophisticated thermal analysis uh, measurements are using IR based heating. You don't have a heating furnace, but you just use a IR heating so that you can concentrate on the sample uh, or the center of the sample. So several sophistications are there with respect to the nature by which we can heat. And then of course the computer to map and analyze the whole thing. Uh, when you consider uh, a thermal event that can happen in a particular sample, there are several issues that are undergoing uh, in, a, in a sample decomposition. Uh, I would like to list it out so that uh, when we look at specific examples, you will see how much of information that we can get out of a simple heating protocol. Now, one is phase transition. A liquid to solid or solid to gas, you can uh, map the phase transition. Uh, absorption or desorption that can happen in heterogeneous catalysis can also be evaluated with a sensitive thermal analytical probe. Melting, that is fusion or sublimation, both can be mapped very clearly using DTE and DSE. And thermal decomposition, uh, uh, solid A going to solid B plus C. C may not be a solid, it can be a gaseous product. So thermal analysis can play a vital role. Radiolytic decomposition or simple glass transition where you can think about uh, the solid going to a liquid phase uh, or a amorphous going to a crystalline phase. All this can be uh, mapped. Mm, oxidation and combustion reactions can be mapped very clearly. Heterogeneous catalysis, as I said, double decomposition, addition, and the dehydration or desolvation reaction. So many um, uh, chemical effects are there when we heat a sample, and all this can be uh, usefully mapped. Uh, let's come a little bit to um, <coughs> understand what a simple thermal uh, gravimetric analysis is. Um, we all know uh, in the postgraduate or undergraduate level, we have done nickel DMG complex, dimethyl glyoxime, which is the red precipitate. And uh, this is a very uh, useful but a time consuming and, uh, uh, and a very laborious gravimetric exercise. Uh, but the <coughs> same material can be very usefully and easily determined using thermogravimetric analysis with a modern instrumentation. I will tell you basically what this instrument is all about. Uh, in the top part of this uh, picture, you can see it's a balance. It's a micro balance which is sensitive uh, with the five digit uh, sensitivity. So any change in milligram quantity can be usefully mapped. Uh, usually the samples uh, are in milligram quantity, therefore you need to have five digit precision. So uh, typically it's a metal balance which we use and uh, this is uh, in this balance you actually suspend the sample here and uh, the sample <coughs> is kept in between uh, furnace wall. So you can actually do the uh, heating here and uh, depending on the uh, weight intake or weight loss the information can be uh, fed from the micro balance. As a result, you can see what is the weight loss against the particular decomposition process that is going on. And it's not that simple as we see here. In this case, the lower chamber, you can apply vacuum and then there are facilities by which you can actually purge the sample with a, a flow of either organ or air atmosphere so that whatever re reaction that is happening, suppose there is gas evolution, it is not exactly concentrated here and it will be flushed out periodically. So a inert gas is usually fl uh, flushed or we can even have air, uh, if the sample needs air, we can flush uh, sample and we can try to map it. This is a typical uh, TG analysis curve which is used and the most referred and uh, <coughs> quoted uh, example is 
uh, calcium oxalate and as you will see uh, a typical uh, CG curve looks like this where you see a bend here and then another bend and another bend. We call this as thermogravimetric steps and each step has something to convey. Therefore, if there is one step and then there is another step and there is another step, we call this as a three step decomposition. And each step might relate to a different uh, physical change and a chemical reaction. I will show you some of the exam uh, example of this in the uh, upcoming slides. Uh, in thermobalance allows monitoring of uh, sample weight as a function of temperature. Uh, now, before we run any sample, uh, two things we need to do. One, you need to do a weight calibration. Another one, you need to do a temperature calibration. Weight calibration you can do with calibrated weights. If you want the temperature calibration, usually you try to take a ferromagnetic uh, <coughs> sample and uh, take it beyond the ferromagnetic transition, for example, nickel, and then you can uh, calibrate your temperature whether the reaction, uh, the transition is exactly happening at that. Then you can do the correction terms. Um, usually, uh, bioenergy uh, effects are uh, very, very crucial when we do uh, TG. Therefore, um, these buoyancy eff effects are largely manifested with the sample <coughs> uh, quantity or with the temperature gradient or the purging rate. You can't just uh, flush the sample with whatever um, atmosphere you want. You can't uh, try to uh, bubble a uh, vigorous flow of these gases. All this will cause buoyancy effect. As a result, it will uh, largely uh, affect your results. Differential thermal analysis, on the other hand, is a two cup cavity. Okay. Uh, in the next slide, I will show you that. Advantages instruments can be used at very high temperature for differential thermal analysis. You can go up to 1000 uh, uh, thousand Kelvin comfortably, and um, it is very sensitive to measure, and uh, there is also flexibility. Uh, in using uh, uh, the sample uh, size uh, and whichever form you want. Mm, characteristic transition or reaction temperature can be accurately determined and uh, one of the disadvantage in DTA could be the uncertainty of uh, heats of fusion, uh, heats of transition and heats of reaction and it can involve a error of 20 to 50 percent. Therefore, uh, while determining the enthalpy of a reaction for transition, usually we resort to uh, differential scanning uh, calorimetry rather than DTA, but DTA also gives essentially same input. Differential th uh, thermal analysis that way, uh, you have an alumina block here and in the alumina <laughs> block you actually have a sample pan and you also have a reference pan and both are connected to the same thermocouple. Uh, platinum rhodium or chromal alum uh, thermocouple and you purge it with uh, either vacuum or inert gas. Now, the difference in the temperature between the sample and the reference will determine your delta T. So, that will be plotted against the temperature. Sample holders are usually aluminum um, because it is very easy to handle, less expensive and you would not like to use the aluminum uh, cups again. You would rather discard so that it is free from um, contamination. Uh, sensitive sensors are needed for measuring the difference uh, because you are using my milligram quantities. Um, platinum rhodium is a very useful one because it shows a linear curve uh, in the high temperature regime from uh, room temperature up to 1000 Kelvin. There is linearity therefore you can use this. So, calibration becomes useful. These are joined together with a differential uh, temperature controller. Therefore, whatever you get is a differential plot. Now, furnace is usually aluminum block as I mentioned earlier and the uh, temperature controller uh, <laughs> controls the furnace temperature. The sample atmosphere is important in determining the reaction that, that takes place. DTA can record either in the presence of oxygen or uh, in inner condition. For example, uh, this is a typical DTA plot that is coming out of an uh, instrument. Uh, 
and you would see there is a small hump here which is actually recorded as a endo peak endothermic peak and there is another one which is actually called a exothermic peak but what you would see here uh, this is a um, endothermic peak relating to uh, the physical chain that is happening where calcium oxalate loses the water molecule and therefore um, dehydration is a endothermic peak but uh, this is not crucial um, as much as uh, the second peak is concerned in the second peak it is a exo peak which involves a unhydrated calcium oxalate going to calcium carbonate okay but this exo peak can miss out if i'm going to heat the sample in nitrogen because in nitrogen it doesn't get the required amount of oxygen to decompose into calcium carbonate therefore it goes as a endo peak in other words it will come out like this so uh, these two peaks are not important for atmosphere but this middle peak becomes important because it will determine whether it is endo or exo so uh, in dta it is very very important to know in which atmosphere you did it so purging uh, a, a purging gas is not just for mere purging but it also affects the chemical process that is happening therefore we need to know for sure uh, again the last step is a uh, Uh, endothermic uh, reaction where calcium carbonate goes to calcium oxide uh, whether you do it in air or in uh, nitrogen it will be the same so the middle peak is determined by the nature of uh, the purging gas in differential ca scanning calorimetry uh, the main uh, difference from dt is that the sample and reference are both maintained at temperature predetermined by the program so at every temperature Uh, during the uh, temperature programmed uh, uh, reaction uh, suppose the sample is at 100 then both the sample and the reference will be maintained at 100 but during the process of the sample chain whatever that is happening that will be recorded either as a endo or a exo peak this is the main difference between dt and dat during a thermal event in the sample the system <coughs> will transform to transfer heat to or from the sample pan to maintain the same temperature so uh, transfer of heat will be happening in order to keep the um, sample and reference at the same temperature there are two ways that you can achieve this um, either using a power compensation method or using a heat flux method i'll show that in the next two slides uh, power con uh, compensation method you actually have two different alumina blocks to heat the pan so you have a sample pan in a different uh, heating block you have the reference in a different heating block and uh, they both are connected to the uh, thermal couple where your delta t is actually maintained at zero delta t is equal to zero um, so in this case your platinum resistance uh, thermal couple is what you use separate sensors and heaters for the sample and uh, the reference Um, then the differential thermal power is supplied to the heaters to maintain the temperature of the sample um, and the reference at the program value so uh, these are the uh, main issues when we talk about power compensation <coughs> dsc when you think of uh, heat flux dsc you actually have the same block to heat both uh, your sample and reference and uh, this is actually mounted mounted on to a constant and that is a uh, very sensitive um, uh, heating block and uh, you actually have two type of sensors there one is chromal constant uh, thermocouple this is for maintaining the differential uh, heat flow whereas chromal alumel thermocouple is there so you have both uh, the thermocouples coming together um, the chromal uh, constant for differential flow and the chromal alumel thermocouple for measuring the individual sample temperature so uh, two different sensors are there in a uh, heat flux dsc unlike the other case so uh, and you uh, the primary difference here is you have one block for heating both the samples temperature difference between the sample and reference is converted to differential thermal power which is nothing but d delta q by dt so this is what is measured which is supplied to the heaters
to maintain the temperature of the sample and the reference at the same value. So this is the primary uh, difference. Now we, I will take specific examples for thermogravimetry and tell uh, how CG can be used and what are all the protocol that we need to follow. As I told you, it is uh, a heating with the thermo balance. Therefore, um, you are essentially main, uh, measuring uh, the percentage uh, weight loss as a function of uh, temperature. The optimum conditions in measuring uh, TG comes from um, taking only few milligrams. And uh, these few milligrams of samples should essentially have a good support on the pan. In other words, if the effective contact area between the pan and the sample has to be maximum because you are playing with very few milligrams and thin layer of sample can be, uh, should be uniformly spread throughout the sample and then it should be an open sample container. You cannot close the container, whereas in the case of DAC, you need to actually close it. Uh, um, it cannot be operated without that. Uh, open sample container mainly because if there is any evolving gas, it does not uh, really create any burst. Uh, inert gas flow uh, is recommended and then slow heating rate. These are important principles for CG. So there are several uh, sample cups which can be used. Uh, quartz you can use because you, it, you can go comfortably up to 1000 K. Uh, copper uh, and uh, nickel, they are very sensitive. Therefore, only for reactions where you anticipate the sample to um, undergo chemical reactions below 200 degrees or so, you can use these samples. Convenience is, um, uh, it is uh, much more cheaper compared to other ones, so you can actually do a one-time reaction and discard it. So, copper uh, samples can also be used. Uh, alumina samples are available, uh, but more expensive for sensitivity aspects, you use aluminum and uh, platinum bowls. Small sample masses and low heating rates increase the resolution but at the expense of sensitivity. Suppose you use very fast heating rate and a large amount of sample, you increase the sensitivity um, but uh, the resolution may be missing. I will show one of the example how you need to make a compromise. So depending on the nature of the sample, you need to um, uh, optimize on the uh, sample um, weight. Uh, typically 3 to 20 milligram is taken uh, and uh, there are several uh, pan configurations that are there. Um, you can have a sealed one also but with a lot of holes so that gases can escape. Uh, same material and configuration should be used for both the sample and the reference. You can't use two different uh, sample holders. Uh, material should be completely uh, covered uh, to the bottom of the pan so that a good thermal uh, con uh, contact is there. And uh, to avoid overfilling the pan to minimize thermal lag, uh, we need to make sure that uh, less amount of sample is there so that uh, sample does not jump out and create any um, temperature lag there. As I told you earlier, uh, TG involves uh, instrument calibration uh, and uh, weight calibration is needed as well as uh, the QD temperature calibration is needed. Today, <coughs> there are many uh, instruments where uh, QD temperature calibration is not needed because uh, you can zero it and adjust the error uh, for temperature. So, but there are uh, several uh, standards which are available like alum, aluminum, uh, nickel, permalloy and iron. All these are having their QD points um, at the specific temperature, so you can use them for internal calibrations. Um, so it is important to have these uh, calibrations made before you start. Typical TG curves are like this, where you can have a flat one. The line is flat. Uh, what do you mean? Then there is no change. There is no problem. Uh, but if there is a small uh, change in the baseline, then that can amount to a glass transition or it could be a desorption and a drying. Uh, a small amount of uh, adsorbed gases or water can be escaping, so that can be easily <coughs> mapped to a small uh, uh, change in the slope. And suppose there is a clear step like this, then you can think about a single stage 
or single step decomposition. If it is a multi step decomposition, then you see curve 4 and uh, you have some uh, steps there, but which is not resolved, then you may have multi step decomposition because of the heating rate, you do not see it more pronounced. Uh, there is another way you suddenly see the curve increasing and reaches a plateau, then it is atmospheric reaction, which means the there is an uptake of uh, air or uh, oxygen to the sample or it could be increasing and then it is go going down, which could be like your 6 interacting with atmosphere, but decomposes at higher temperature. All these are possible in a uh, TG curve. Uh, as I told you, uh, if it is just one step, one stage decomposition, then uh, it is very easy for us to map. But if there is a curve like this, uh, you really do not know um, because it is not very well resolved at some time. So, you do not know what is this, uh, but you can easily map this uh, slope and this slope because there is a clear plateau. So, in such case, you actually transfer the data. Uh, TG data and you make a differential plot. So, differential TG will tell you how many crucial steps are there. For example, this single step decomposition means in T DTG will give you only one maximum and this is not XO or ENDO. Uh, th we should not confuse this with the DTA. This is not ENDO XO peak. This is just a differential plot. So, you can know for sure that this is the midpoint of such a transition. Suppose this is a multi stage decomposition, then you have essentially four maxima. So, four different things are happening. So, this DTG is more useful if you have a uh, multi step uh, reaction or many processes are going through uh, such a reaction. Some more applications of TG uh, accurate definition of conditions for drying analytical precipitates can be noted. Uh, thermal stability of uh, different materials, for example, drugs, uh, conditions of polymer degradation, metal oxidation, metal combustion can be uh, noted, fingerprint minerals um, or you can identify polymers. For example, this is a DG, uh, sorry, TG curve of various polymers. As you will see, this is polymethyl mesacrylate uh, showing this uh, uh, trace. Uh, polyvinyl chloride shows uh, like this low uh, density polyethylene or uh, Teflon PTFE they all show a different weight loss which means uh, you can understand the thermal stability of such polymers using a simple uh, thermogravimetric uh, protocol and uh, if you if you are actually uh, doing this um, process for, for a particular sample uh, it is it is good to involve all the um, exercise where you have a combined uh, uh, measurement that is TG, DTG and DTA so that all the parameters can be evaluated not just the weight loss but also find out uh, <coughs> what, uh, what is the nature of uh, such chemical reaction. So, typically this is your uh, uh, DTA plot which shows several valleys which each one amounts to uh, a particular phenomena that is happening in Italy alumina salt. So, there may be uh, many uh, useful informations coming if you have a combined technique. I will show some more examples of that in the next few slides. Uh, so, uh, one of the first ever uh, multiple technique uh, or combined approach that was uh, in the form of instrument was TG, DTG, DTA. Now, we also have a combined technique with DAC which is coming uh, in the modern instruments. Uh, I am going to give you some examples from our own work uh, where TG has proved useful. Uh, in some of the lectures in, the, uh, in this present course, I have touched on the same examples, but I will just uh, highlight this in a, uh, with respect to TG as the, this uh, lecture is mainly on thermogrammetry. First, I will try to show you how alloys can be mapped, then hydrogen bonding can be evaluated using thermal technique and how in OLED application this can be used and also in magnetic materials. And this is one of the useful work uh, 
where a, a new uh, cobalt iron alloy precursor was uh, made and um, this was converted into cobalt ferrite and uh, it is very difficult to prepare this COFE2 alloy. So how do we know that we have made this alloy? If you actually do a XRD, you can clearly see that this is the X-ray pattern of the alloy precursor. It's a very reactive alloy precursor. But if you actually heat this sample, then it gets converted to cobalt ferrite. Now, one should know whether it is truly the alloy which is getting converted to uh, the iron, ox uh, iron oxide or how much of this cobalt ferrite is uh, getting converted to iron oxide. Uh, this is the place where CG comes into picture. This is the thermogravimetric uh, curve which clearly shows that there is nearly a 20%, 21% of uh, a gain in the weight. Uh, so, uh, instead of losing weight, here you see an uptake, which means COFE2 is getting converted to COFE2O4 by taking atmospheric air. As a result, you see nearly a 20% weight loss. But if you really quantify this result, you will find out that around 1 to 2% uh, or 1 to 5%, so to say, uh, of uh, cobalt ferrite is already present in the sample, which cannot be detected by the X-ray, and uh, um, nearly 95% of the alloy is in actual COFE2 uh, form. Uh, this is uh, a very important uh, uh, information to know whether any um, ferrite <coughs> precipitates are already there in the sample even before conversion from alloy to oxide. So such fine uh, details you can try to get it and uh, this is another uh, important work where we found uh, hydrogen bonding uh, was evaluated mainly uh, from a TG diagram. Uh, this is a benz uh, uh, imidazole molecule which is attached to a phenyl ring in uh, one two position it is attached. So you would see uh, this imidazole uh, can either be intramolecularly hydrogen bonded or in, uh, intramolecularly hydrogen bonded. In this case, there is an intramolecular hydrogen bonding. In this case, intramolecular hydrogen bonding. You can clearly see between these two isomers, the TG pattern is very different. The one which is actually hydrogen bonded with other molecules, intramolecular hydrogen bonding shows a very high decomposition temperature compared to uh, intramolecular hydrogen bonding. So, such information ca you can easily find out, but without this uh, information, uh, it would have been a partial justification of hydrogen bonding if we had just shown the change in the PL uh, emission between a solid uh, for the intramolecular hydrogen bonded and the intramolecular hydrogen bonded uh, sample. So, TG can provide a vital information. And same uh, in the case of uh, OLED applications, as you know, several molecules are made. Several molecules are there uh, and each of these molecules are actually deposited in this layer, but we are actually looking for making new organic molecules. When we make this sort of uh, OLED device, one of the important criteria is it has to be amorphous. So one of the important criteria in this OLED uh, fabrication is when you make this organic film, it should not crystallize. If it crystallizes, then the uh, electrical connectivity will be lost. And as a result, you need to make amorphous films of these organic molecules to provide a electrical continuity. So when you actually deal with polymers, you don't have this problem because when you uh, evaporate these organic molecules, they form essentially a very good connectivity because they are amorphous. But when you go for crystalline organic material, uh, when you fabricate this, there will be electrical discontinuity as a result, the device op operation will fail even after a first cycle, it, it cannot be sustained. So one of the problems involved in uh, organic LEDs is to make thermally as well as electro uh, uh, electrochemically they should be a more rugged molecule, rather it should withstand several uh, heating cycles or several uh, current cycles. So uh, the emphasis is to actually make uh, bigger organic molecules. 
bigger the molecule more the molecular weight less the crystallization temperature in other words you can actually improve on the decomposition temperature or the melting temperature so if the melting temperature is pushed far further then you can actually make a much better film uh, so for that matter if you can take a, a benzene tetracarboxylic dianhydride as your starting material you can try to put uh, two amino phenol and uh, using this uh, two amino phenol you can essentially uh, make a compound like this as you would see that the uh, dihydride is now substituted with uh, four such benz uh, thiazol molecules so what you are essentially doing is instead of just uh, adding one molecule to this you are uh, substituting four as a result you make a bulky organic molecule and as you would see from the pg pattern here uh, typically uh, a one or two uh, benz thiazol substituted molecules will have the melting point uh, somewhere here but you can see that the uh, melting point and the subsequent decomposition temperature is pushed by at least 150 degrees C so uh, this is a single uh, step melting point uh, which involves a, a decomposition somewhere around 550 degrees C so these are molecules which are recommended for OLED application because they will not crystallize easily and spoil the device application and uh, you would see here uh, this is the dpg pattern which is corresponding to the single step decomposition here and uh, this curve is nothing but your uh, uh, differential uh, thermal analysis curve dpa which first shows uh, some glass transition and then it shows melting and then the decomposition so all these are uh, easily mapped in the combined technique so it is very useful to um, analyze and to recommend the sort of materials that you need uh, in uh, one of the um, <coughs> modules i have quoted this e uh, example where simple tg can actually bring about a, a great amount of insight into mechanism uh, that is of uh, fundamental as well as um, application uh, oriented uh, uh, studies uh, in this uh there was a confusion about the magnetism that was happening at room temperature <coughs> in manganese doped zinc oxide and this is a paper published in nature materials uh in the year uh, uh 2006 <coughs> sorry 2005 um so you can refer to this uh, particular paper to to understand how simple tg uh, analysis can be used to resolve such a um mysterious uh, uh, behavior in the samples as you would know zinc oxide is a semiconductor it's not a magnetic uh, compound but just substituting 2% of manganese manganese itself is not a magnetic ion uh, further and you can still see a room temperature look so in that case it was thought that a new system has emerged in for device applications called as dilute magnetic semiconductor but later it was understood that it is not a substitution oriented magnetism but it is some other impurity which is giving um, uh, uh, giving the origin for this magnetic uh, curve and uh, what was uh, finally uh, used to resolve this mystery was the tg plot here as you would see uh, simple thermogravimetry uh, to Uh, make a composite of 2% mno2 grounded with zinc oxide finally went on to prove that it is not manganese which is substituting in uh, zinc oxide rather it is some amount of zinc which is going into manganese oxide in other words in mn2o3 phase uh, which is actually responsible for uh, such a magnetic origin so it is very very vital although it looks simple uh, not many would even call this as a, uh, a prima facie uh, important characterization tool uh, but you would see that a simple technique can really alter uh, confusion that prevails in the scientific community therefore tg mapping is very important uh, now i will take you through some uh, issues related to differential scanning calorimetry because 
uh, here you can quantify more results. Uh, as I told you, there is a basic difference between DTE and DSC. Uh, this is here temperature differences are me measured, whereas here uh, the, uh, the heat flow uh, from or out of the system uh, sample is actually measured. Applications uh, of both the techniques are similar, whereas DSC is more popular because it, uh, it can uh, give you uh, understanding on to the heat exchange that is happening. Uh, whereas DJ is uh, conveniently used because you can go down, go up to very high temperatures. Um, in DAC, one of the things that you need to do is calibration. Uh, you cannot just uh, take the result uh, at its face value and do the quantification. So the baseline correction is very important. For example, if you get an endothermic peak like this, this is the way you try to deconvolute the peaks where you try to draw this uh, baseline and then you do this uh, uh, peak correction such a way that the area under the curve is a measure of the amount of heat that is either taken or released. So essentially you can uh, determine uh, <coughs> the heat capacity or you can determine the uh, delta H of fusion or delta H of combustion, all this can be uh, maximized. Therefore, baseline correction or the uh, estimation of the area under the peak is very, very important. So, evaluation of the thermal resistance of the sample and the reference sensors uh, need to be taken care. It is a two step process. The temperature difference of the two empty crucibles have to be first measured and then the thermal response is then acquired for a standard material, especially using sapphire. Sapphire because melting point is above uh, 1700 degrees C. Therefore, you use sapphire as the sample calibrant. Amplified DAC signal is automatically varied with temperature to maintain a constant calorimetric sensitivity with temperature. Uh, DSC calibration can be done uh, with a variety of uh, calibrants. Um, for example, you can, uh, if you are uh, dealing with high temperature samples, you can use metals. And if your sample is metal, then you can use metal as well. Uh, some inorganics are also good for uh, as calibrants. KNO3 potassium perchlorate. Mm, organics, uh, for example, polystyrene, benzoic acid, anthracene can be used. And uh, one of the important points is the calibrants should be of high purity, they should be thermally stable, they should not uh, undergo changes with the light, they should be non hygroscopic, which is much, much more <coughs> important, and it should not react with the pan or with the atmosphere that is uh, perchlorate. Uh, there are typical features that can uh, be understood from a DSC curve uh, for a polymeric uh, system. For example, if you take uh, sulfur pyridine, so many useful information that you can get. Number one, you see a small change in the slope, which actually refers to glass transition, that is uh, step A. And uh, in uh, sequence B, it is actually a crystallization from a melt to a crystallize crystallization, which is uh, which is a phase. Uh, phase transition and then uh, here you you actually have a melting of metastable modification that is happening in event D uh, which is the endothermic peak and then the melting of a stable modification which is another endothermic peak. So uh, you start with uh, one sample and then you actually take it through crystallization after crystallization, it goes into a metastable form, which is nothing but your phase transition, which is your even C, where you don't see anything particular. But then you you see uh, again two successive um, endothermic peaks that relates to two different metastable phases before the sample finally decomposes. So endothermic events are melting, sublimation, solid-solid transition, dis dissolvation chemical reaction, exothermic peaks are crystallization, decomposition and the chemical reaction. Um, baseline shifts are mostly due to glass transition as you see here. Baseline shifts are very, very milder and therefore you need to be very careful while analyzing it. Um, but you should also understand any ups and downs in the DAC curve does not mean something is happening. For example, several artifacts can be recognized 
both in the exopeak as well as endopeak. In the exopeak, if the sample topples uh, over um, in, in the pan, then you get a fluctuation like this or sample pan is distorted or uh, if you have a mechanical shock of the me measuring cell or if the flow of air is leaked out, then you would see this sort of noise coming up. Uh, similarly, in the endopeak, if you see some sort of a plateau like this, it is not exo or endo. Actually, it is electrical uh, spikes and spikes can come like this. Um, you also have burst of the uh, pan. So, uh, several uh, artifacts can come in a typical DAC, which we should be watchful. And uh, in DAC, predominantly, mm -hmm. you are talking about the thermal stability where you can analyze several of these events which are happening or you can measure the heat flow depending on the uh, nature of the peak or you can look at the chemical purity, you can look at the state transition. All these informations you can get from a DAC curve. If you are looking at a typical endothermic peak, which is a transition temperature, actually the onset of this has to be linear if your peak is to be assessed. It can also be a non-linear curve. It can be more Gaussian. In such case, it tells something different. So, this is the um, onset of the transition and this is the peak of the transition. In this case, if it is a melting, then this is how it is done. And uh, <coughs> if your um, sample is pure, then there, there will be a linearity here. If your sample is impure, for example, then you would see the onset is actually more with a curvature. That means the sample is impure. And if suppose there is some other eutectic impurity that is there, it will also show off like another small uh, peak. Uh, if there is a, a endothermic peak that is melting followed by a exothermic decomposition, it would come out like this. If it is an endothermic uh, decomposition followed by melting, then it would come out like this. And uh, in that case, uh, actually glass transitions, although they are look very minimal, one can actually try to resolve to find out whether there is a linearity in the slope which indicates there is a glass transition. And in such case, if you do the baseline correction, you will be able to see what is the enthalpy uh, that is involved in this glass transition. This is one of our own work where you take amorphous alloys of cobalt <coughs> platinum and if you try to heat the sample, you can map w what sort of transformation that is happening. For example, if you do this forward run, there is a glass transition which amounts to a good endothermic peak. After that, there is an exothermic peak which actually corresponds to crystallization, which is a FCC to FC3 transformation. Uh, so, it is an exothermic peak. So, when you cool this sample, Again, you see the same thing happening where FC, FCT is now reversible to FCC. So, this phase transition is a reversible one. Therefore, on the cooling, you would see a reversible curve. But once you go again for the next run, you can see because of the previous uh, proto, uh, you know, uh, sweep, uh, the area of this curve has tremendously reduced, which means most of the sample has got crystallized. So, this much information you can get about amorphous alloys, uh, about its glass transition, about the crystallization process and whether it is a reversible or a irreversible uh, uh, transformation. So, all this information you can get from DAC curve. Enthalpy of fusion, for example, you can try to measure. It could be a multiple uh, thermal steps or it could be a single melting step and uh, the delta H of fusion can be measured and I will also show one more example how purity can be determined. For example, if you take benzoic acid, depending on the purity of these samples, the endothermic peak uh, will actually shift. So, that will tell you the sort of purity of your sample. So, this is a good measure by which you can measure the purity and uh, lastly, I will uh, touch upon the heating rate. Suppose you heat the sample at 0.5 degree, then you get a single peak and then one peak here. If you increase the sample uh, heating rate, you can see same transformation, but it is actually giving a very different protocol. So, 
uh, to obtain thermal events close to the true thermodynamic value, the recommended heating rates are 1 to 5 degree per minute. That is what is recommended and it has to be done at a very, very uh, slow uh, purging rate of your um, air, air or organ atmosphere. Otherwise, uh, same process but you get a confusing uh, uh, GAC curves. Uh, lastly, uh, I would also like to touch upon this issue that uh, TG can be combined with FTIR or it can be combined with mass spec. Uh, so, uh, you can evaluate the evolved gases. For example, calcium oxalate carbonate heated, carbon dioxide comes, carbon dioxide can be measured using IR cell. So, all this um, multiple techniques or hyphenated techniques can be uh, studied using this protocol. So, uh, in that way, uh, evolved gas analysis evol and evolved gas detection can be achieved using a mass spectra or it can be connected to a online GC, gas chromatography. So, best practices of thermal analysis use small sample size, good thermal contact between sample and sensing device, proper sample encapsulation when you are talking about DAC and uh, starting temperature well below expected transition temperature, slow scanning speeds, proper instrument calibration and then purging gas uh, should not be corrosive and avoid decomposition in the DSC. So, these are the best practices with which one can get very useful information. There are several uh, groups uh, both in chemistry and physics where they use the thermogrammetry essentially to resolve many, many fascinating features that happen during daily research activities.